And when you go to a school like Alabama, where they could potentially have 3,000 girls going through recruitment and only 18 houses available, you know, how do you how do you stand out, right? Everybody kind of looks the same. That's by design because it's marketing. They want to market themselves as a certain type of house or sorority on campus, and it's so that they can pull in those same types of girls. I'm allowed to wear denims on game day, and I do remember this. This was basically just to force us to wear a dress. My sorority particularly, you also weren't allowed to wear any makeup on initiation. This woman says she got the boot because her hair tie was mistaken for a wiretap. I did get kicked out of Alabama's recruitment process because they did think the hair tie was a wire. Part of an exclusive group where there is limited amount of membership and there's a portal and a pathway through, it makes you feel special and unique. Hi everyone, it's Isabella here and welcome back to the channel. So today's video, we are gonna be covering the infamous Bama Rush. You guys know every year on a very special time, we see tons of TikToks and posts about Bama Rush where a bunch of people are running in, well, rushing. They're rushing to join a Bama sorority, right? Now, so many people are curious about this and I was like, you know what would be fun? I would love to dive into Bama Rush and some of the really hidden details about it, I would say, and how honestly a lot of this, in my opinion, is really problematic and shouldn't be glorified. Now, don't get me wrong. I think it's really similar to when we watch like, for example, reality shows, right? It's fun, it's interesting, it's someone else's drama, but hell no, will we participate, right? However, I think we kind of need to talk about how problematic Bama Rush is and how this sounds like a system that should not be upheld. We are gonna dive into so many details that I personally think the documentary missed out. We're gonna talk about cost, what's going on, the machine, so many other interesting things that I personally found with diving into Bama Rush. And we're gonna talk about it all in here in one big old video. So before we hop into today's video, don't forget to that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel and click the bell button down below. My blog channel, merch and podcasts are in the description below if you guys are interested, along with my Instagram and TikTok if you wanna come hang out there with me. And yeah, let's get into it. So let's talk about Bama Rush and what even really goes on with this. So starting off, let's give a big basis of what to expect. So for me, I was like, oh, I'm sure Bama Rush actually starts off, you know, in the typical time that school does around August time. Oh no, no, no. This is an entirely different ball game. So apparently Bama Rush, even though the website says otherwise, recruitment actually does not begin in August with formal recruitment. The sororities actually start making lists of the PNMs they are excited about in January of the girls' senior year. At Bama, it's not just important, it's absolutely essential to get on the recruitment team's radar as soon as you commit so that the chapter is aware of your existence. You have to submit photos, letters of recommendation, and an application. So I was looking in like, this is a very serious process to get into sorority. And many people are like, okay, well, what are the benefits of, you know, being in a sorority? So I actually have covered this about the entire like problematic history of Greek life in general. And I made a video about this a good while ago, if you're interested. Now, big old preface I have to say, and I think a lot of my viewers are critically thinking, I'm not gonna shit on you if you're in a sorority, okay? I'm not shitting on you if you have been in one. What I think it's important is to have conversations about the good, bad, and ugly of many different systems and businesses and everything. And if we really think about it, Bammer Rush is a business in a way and an entire system that's been upheld for a long time. There's a lot of things that some people don't know about and probably need some reassurance that they're not crazy when they think something's wrong. Now, I'm sure I'm gonna get the unhinged people that like, you're shitting on this because you're jealous and blah, blah. Girl, I'm gonna tell you right now, I mean, with just all the love in the world. Not an inch of me is jealous of your sorority, okay? I like the silence of not living with anyone and dealing with the requirements of a bunch of people. Love it. I love not having my social media monitored. I love doing whatever the fuck I want and being a feral bitch on TikTok on a Tuesday, okay? Love that. So I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't wanna touch your hand when I say this. Not at all, okay? Anyways, let's let's kick out this off. So the benefits of sororities and just any Greek life in general can kind of vary really, but a lot of people think that it can help so much when it comes to just socialization, growth and growth in your entire career and so much more. So for example, you're kind of a part of a lifelong legacy in the weirdest way possible because you're simply connected with something. Now you actually could have really great benefits when it comes to maybe finding people that can help out with your raids. Maybe you could just be simply associated with someone and have a better appearance and look because you're associated with said group, right? Maybe you have it to where you get a lot more fun benefits and inclusivity on events and so much more because you're a part of a sorority. Now, from what I was able to look into, there's a big old ranking system when it comes to sororities and how 
how people want to be in a specific one because that apparently equals to you being like the best or better, whatever the case may be. So it's highly important for many people and a lot of people in this area and kind of across the country have thought of this to be such a significant thing to get a part of and become really. And so many of them don't realize that there's a lot of underlying problematic behaviors with getting this, just like with starting to even be personally viewed as someone who is a potential to get into the system. So starting off, like I said, you have to submit applications and it is, oh girl, it is a long process, okay? One thing that they don't really talk about a lot is sorority consultants. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, this is this is something that I think is really fascinating. I truly think a lot of this stuff is who has more money and can play around and find out with money. This is something that is more accessible to people that have money, or this is gonna be a money pit if you are that desperate. Sorority consultants can be expensive. There's actually a coaching company that I wanted to talk about that's called Getting a Bid. It has a program available for PNMs for $649. Now, what these consultants essentially do is help you prep and get ready to have a good face and be someone who would be wanted by said groups. Now, to me, that sounds insane, okay? That sounds unhinged to want to pay someone to coach you to get into a girl group. I don't know, that kind of gives me the ick in five different ways, but I'll just leave it at that. Another example is sorority prep, which offers one three-hour class for $500. And according to a 2021 Fortune article, hiking in heels is another one that offers two packages to PNMs, one premium package for $1,496 and another elite package for $2,975. Now, what these will really include is essentially coaching you on how how to put the best application, how to talk to them, how to drill, like they will coach you on essentially becoming the perfect person that a sorority would want to recruit. So you have the best opportunities possible to get into one or the best one for that matter. Sam walks up the stairs to her first sorority. She hears chanting in the background and the president welcomes her to the sorority. She cannot help but wonder what questions are the members going to ask me? What should I say? And when she crosses the threshold, a member walks up to her and says, hi, welcome to XYZ. My name is Bailey, what's your name? And after she walks out of the sorority, she says, that was so easy. I just have to answer the member's questions. I can do this. As the day continues, she's asked the same 10 questions at most of the sororities. And when she's voting on the sororities, she doesn't know which sororities to keep and which sororities to drop. The other potential new members in her group share gossip with her, and this gossip helps Sam decide which sororities to drop. The next morning, she's excited to get her schedule back for round two. When she gets it, she's shocked. The maximum number of sororities she could have been invited back was 10. She's only invited back to five, and now she starts to panic. She wonders, did I do something wrong? Am I not pretty enough? This is not fair. I got recommendation letters. I have a 4.0 GPA. I was in the National Honor Society and president of three clubs. The YouTube videos I watched did not prepare me for this situation. And the story I just shared is common for a lot of potential members during sorority recruitment. Most potential members are not invited back to the maximum number of sororities for each round, and they're dropped from sororities they like. And step number five is to understand what the members are looking for in new members. Because when you have these normal, genuine conversations and you know what they're looking for, again, when they go back to their scorecard to give you a score, they're not saying, oh my God, I don't know what score to give this potential member. They're saying she deserves the best score and if I don't give it to her, she might get dropped. I have to give her that best score. If you need help creating your plan for sorority recruitment, I encourage you to check out The Ultimate Guide to Sorority Recruitment. The Ultimate Guide to Sorority Recruitment is a tool that breaks down how to create your campaign. Additionally, you're gonna avoid the three conversation mistakes that most potential members are making, and these mistakes lead to them getting dropped. Now again, most of us, I, many people just don't have $2,000 lying around, and many people are trying to attend college, I, again, don't really have money to just mess around when it comes to this. So a lot of people may be purchasing, maybe trying to work with consultants, and they might not even have the funds to do so. Or if you do, then it's just a very easy expense that some of these girls' parents drop, quite frankly, and they're able to just easily get all these training. Now my thing is, is with the consultants alone, this sounds like a whole lot of effort for a Again, just simply joining a group of people. Paying in to have friends is what I like to think of it. Now here's another quote that I actually found that was really fascinating. Although it's expensive, it's nothing compared to the money PNMs are paying to actually rush. Between the fees, clothes, dues, and more, actually the Bama Rush documentary on HBO valued rushing at the University of Alabama to cost $8,300. So if you're thinking twice about spending the money on a sorority rush consultant, you may want to think about whether rushing is something in your budget too. Hacking and Heels co-founder Stasia Damron told Elite daily, the sorority views recruitment as an investment. If someone is going through college on a full scholarship and plans on working the entire time they're in college, recruitment might not be something that they are seeking out. So I think that statement alone should talk about how this is exclusive for people who, I'm going to say it, have 
in parents' money, okay? When I went to college, which was in 2018 when I first started, boom, girl, it was expensive. I did, I worked, I literally worked, and it's expensive as hell. And honestly, thinking of it as investment, I think is such an odd thing. Like why, I can't wrap my noggin around wanting to invest money into something like this. What are the true benefits? People's view of you? Like that's the only thing I can truly wrap my head around it. So real quickly, I know we talked about benefits when it comes to joining a sorority, but I wanted to actually whip up an exact example and list so that are benefits allegedly from joining a sorority that's a part of Bamber Rush. So this is something I found on a website for this sorority and I want to kind of go through because I feel like again these benefits are severely overhyped. So for example let's start with leadership right. I know they're talking about providing many ways to have leadership development opportunities. Here's the thing though I completely disagree with that because if we really think about all the rules regulations and things that you have to follow that's actually fighting completely against the concept of teaching you leadership and it's more teaching you how to abide by the rules, follow everything strictly, and if anything, follow old dated rules that have no benefit to you. The second one I want to talk about is scholarships. And while absolutely scholarships are so significant, one, I feel like if anything, cost of being a part of sororities is really expensive. So that's already a big problem in itself. But two, there's many other scholarships that people can have access to and apply to that have no affiliation with the actual sorority. Third one is sisterhood. Again, I think you can find and make friends completely without that. I believe that the sisterhood concept kind of toys on the idea of someone who is uncomfortable with making friends regularly. And I'm here to tell you, honestly, especially if you're in college, there are so many ways of making friends. And I feel like when it comes to sororities, it's completely unnecessary. And if anything, gonna make it harder for you to make friends because of how much restrictions there are on you. And then last but not least, service. There are many ways that they mentioned that they can help you do good when it comes to like philanthropy and everything. And again, I'm gonna tell you right now, as someone who was in college and did my own individual volunteering, I would have highly recommend you to do that instead. You do not need a sorority, for example, to provide benefits of volunteering or helping out. You can literally do that on your own. I have done that so many times. So again, I think all of this is overpriced and overhyped and is a glorified group that you can join that is going to end up costing you a lot of money. And also, peace and love. This is classes as shit and I will say that to the day I die, okay? This is classes as because all it is is saying, you have money, stick, join us. The people that have more capability to throw on money and lurk a certain way are probably gonna get prioritized more because it keeps the visuals and aesthetic of the entire sorority a lot higher. Now, prepping for rush, you can also do with the consultants, but you have many other things that you have to do in order to get yourself ready to even go about this. Letters of recommendation and an application video are what I found to be big requirements for a lot of places to even just get yourself involved with this. And I think it's kind of fascinating how you have to have letters of recommendation from people to participate in this. Like, I don't comprehend how that's in any way something that makes sense to me. But think about that, right? You have to have all these things just to start, just to get rolling, right? Just to get rolling in this shit. Now let's talk about the actual starting the process of rushing, okay? This is what I, I thought was fascinating. There's an entire schedule of rushing. Now I want y'all to comment down below and tell me if this sounds super fun and not exhausting to you. August 9th to Friday, August 11th, early move in on campus only. Saturday, August 12th, convocation morning. Saturday, August 12th, again, is open house in the afternoons. Sunday, August 13th, philanthropy day one. Monday, August 14th, philanthropy day two. Then day three on the 15th. Then 16th is sisterhood day. The second sisterhood day is on the 17th. And then the third is on the 18th. And then preference day one, August 19th. And Sunday, August 20th is bid day. That is a shit ton of days of not working and not working on a bunch of shit when it comes to like preparing for school. I would, I'm sorry, hell no. That sounds like absolute chaos. That's a lot of effort, of course, for someone to be putting in there. And think about all the effort you have to do to have a good outfit, right? To have yourself put together completely, to keep yourself great and good to go. And again, enticing for all these people, not to mention remembering the rules, remembering how to speak to the people that you're interested in pressing, just sounds completely exhausting. And in my opinion, not worth it. I I truly think that the value in this has simply been put by people who have made a value. There's truly, in my opinion, no actual value there. And I think it's way more problematic than we realize. And again, sure, we're gonna see a bunch of people that have designer things that are getting dressed up, you know, to go to all these events to get ready for college. But if we really think about it, this is honestly a really odd system that people get so excited for with rushing. There are, again, like I said, rules that you have to follow. So for example, I'll have some pop up on the screen over here of how there's certain people you actually cannot converse with or talk to while 
don't, you're rushing, or if you're actually a part of the sorority, helping other people rush as well. There's certain things you can't say, there's certain time limits you can't pass, or you can get fined, so much more. The amount of horror stories I've personally seen of people having to be fined for things and minor things that that is insane. So this is honestly, in my opinion, a money pit. And this is just for getting started. We are just touching the surface level of this, okay? So let's get into money. I know we briefly mentioned that previously, but I wanna kinda dig into it a little bit further. Cause again, I think it's a big topic when it comes to Bama Rush. According to the university, members spend more than $4,000 on fees per semester just to be a part of this. Uh, however, for those living in the house with added meal fees, that could go up to around $7,500 per semester. So again, that's not including like your school. That is how much money you have in order to be a part of these sororities. That is a, a lot of money to do that, okay? For I, I, shit, hell no. That is not something that's worth it. And then 7,500. There was another girl actually by the name of Jess who claimed a sorority tried to charge her $3,200 for missing recruitment. Now I know so many people are gonna be like, but it looks so fun and they look like women happy family. I'm gonna tell you right now, a system that runs like this is not always gonna be a big happy family. I don't care if I'm called a hater, girl boss. That is not normal to find people and charge people for very, very small things or someone just simply doesn't want to do that. Like, I All right, everyone, I know we were just talking about roles and I found APA recruitment rules that were allegedly approved this February of this year. Now, these things are called fine infractions. These are fines that are due within 30 days of each chapter's final receipt invoice for recruitment infractions. These are things that they are going to charge you for. Now, if you're part of the sorority, it looks like this is something you would deal with if you finally join and fuck up. For example, if PNMs, people you know that are potentially gonna join, a potential new members leave the party with any new items, including favors, the exception to this rule will be non-branded water bottles. That is a $20 per PNM. The next one is initiating a hug of a potential new member. That is $20 per occurrence. You see how ridiculous this is so far with these fines? Like. I I can't wrap my head around how these are legit fines that are paid and are real. Now, this was the longer list that I actually found. And again, this is this is a big one. So let's get into it. Recruitment party going over time limit, $25 per minute. Active member saying, see you later or see you tomorrow as a potential new member leaves. The chapter facility, $15 per occurrence. Turning in invitation and or bid listed late to the Office of Fraternity and Sorority Life, $250 per 15 minutes. Now turning in a flex minus list slash recruitment round to the Office of fraternity and sorority life, 500. Adding a P and M back to an invitation and or bid list after list submission deadline, $500 per PNM slash round. Turning in recruitment receipts after the six week deadline, $25 a day, up to 30 days, then mediation. Showing an unapproved video during recruitment is $3,000 per day. Video submission after set deadline, July 14th, $250 per day per video. Final comprehensive recruitment plan submission after set deadlines, May 1st, $250 a day. A time gap longer than 20 minute seconds between potential new members exiting the threshold of the house at the conclusion of a party, $50 each additional 20 seconds. And when using the front door other than recruitment or Greek life personnel at any time prior to or after a party, $50 occurrence. Sorority woman entering the house after 30 minutes prior to, during, or following a party, $50 per member. Chapter writing, any writing correspondence, including preference letters to potential new members, $100 occurrence. Degrading of another sorority, $200 occurrence. Improper, unauthorized commenting on a potential new member's social media beginning May 1st, extending to the time bids are distributed, $200 occurrence and or referral for mediation. Improper, unauthorized communication with potential new members using text, direct messaging, and or personal interactions beginning May 1st and extending to the bids are distributed, $400 per occurrence and or referral for our mediation friend requests from chapter Instagram accounts to potential new members after May 1st, $200. Friend requests to potential new members after August 1st, $200 occurrence and or referral for mediation. If any chapter meets or exceeds the contract, the contact fines of $2,500, they will be subject to the panalytic judging process. Members of recruitment team resigning after the May 1st deadline, $200 occurrence. Now I would really like to ask every one of you, does any of this sound fun? Does any of this sound interesting? Does any of this sound entertaining? What in the hell is this showing you about teaching you leadership? What in the hell is this teaching you about philanthropy? What in the absolute f 
fuck is this teaching you about friendships? This does not sound like fun. This does not sound exciting. This does not like sound like it will provide you benefits. It is going to be an overwhelming mess. I do not give a shit how these girls look. I don't care how they post. I don't care how exciting they claim it is. This is a glorified group, in my opinion, that has been made to be fun for the people who are prioritized, look a certain way, and have money. If you don't fall under that category, it may be hard for you. And even for the people who have money, they might still have to follow all these rules and regulations, not to mention all the other requirements, rules that are hidden for me that I can't even find. I'm telling you right now, this stuff does not look fun. It sounds very controlling, and I'm gonna tell you right now, a lot of the behaviors sound extremely culty, okay? As someone who's looked into cults before, this behaviors and practices sound very gatekeepy, it sounds very problematic, and peace and love, it sounds like you are not gonna be in a very safe area and you're gonna be shamed if you don't spend money, if you don't act a certain way, and that does not sound like a welcoming good environment ever. Now, another thing that I noticed too is when you apply, you also have to spend money just to even apply. It actually says, starts May 1st of 2023 for the application. You have to at least drop around $375 just to apply, just to apply. I'm sorry, who the f has application money like that? $375, this is not normal, okay? The only people that think it's normal are thinking that this is some incredible opportunity. I'm gonna tell you right now, it is not. It's not, this is actually insane. So now when it comes to investment, right? And how much money is really flowing through this. A lot of people on the Greek life side and member side have a certain amount of money that they have in order to host fence and things like that when it comes to rushing it in the house. Actually, according to a book that I was able to find, you can't exceed a level of $40,000 for a lot of this stuff, which is kind of wild to me how a sorority has access to that much money just for random little fun things. You see, you see what I'm getting at? And don't get me wrong, I know there's a lot of sororities and organizations that are like, oh, well, we do a lot of philanthropy, right? We help people out. There is no need for that much money to be flying out just for random stuff. You could use that money instead to help people. But you see how this is a system that's uplifting a specific culture and lifestyle and they're enticing people to join. It's more of a business and money maker, in my opinion, than actually benefiting you. However, I think a lot of them want you to think that it's an investment and really worth your time because the entire system as a whole makes a lot of money and honestly funnels probably a ton of money into the university. All right, you guys, now let's kind of start off with when you get in. Now, with all that being said, many people put in links and links in order to even be a part of this and they go out of their way to write their top schools that they wanna join. They dress up, they post on TikTok, they do all the things that they can to make themselves appear to be incredible and more. They practice how they're going to talk to people so that way they say the right things and look perfect and ladylike. And then let's say you get into your choice sorority and everyone's excited, right? It's not that simple. If anything, you have to watch your back and be very cautious because a lot of rules are in place and there's a lot of favoritism allegedly in a lot of these sororities. So when you get in, there's many different rules that are on sororities versus fraternities. I would like to put that out there. One of the things I would like to say is there is a level of hazing that can exist in both. There's actually been reports that there has been hazing in many different organizations like the sororities and fraternities. However, it's been kept very hush-hush, allegedly because a lot of people don't want it getting aired out that there's some serious issues, which with that much money going into a system like that, it would understand how a lot of that stuff would be hush-hush and not many people would know about it. Now, real quickly though, I wanna talk about some of the rules that are involved when you're actually in the place. Now, this is what's so fascinating to me is I don't think a lot of people have access to the rules before they join. I think they have this facade of, ooh, this looks really good. This looks fun and special. Oh my God, I want to join. And then when they join is when they realize, oh shit, there's a lot of requirements for me. And I think that is such a huge red flag to me because additionally, there are, it's really hard for me even to find certain rules. And when they're trying to hide that kind of stuff, I think that should say a lot to you. I think that should say a lot about how this is not an organization that's going to be the best for you, especially if they're hiding the rules and they don't want anyone knowing. Or for example, if you actually can't record in certain parts of the building or you can't even record in certain aspects of the sorority. That should tell you a lot. If they're hiding something like that and they're trying to gatekeep, I'm gonna tell you right now, that means some bad shit's going on and they don't want you knowing, which has led to people actually airing out some of these rules and the ridiculous rules of that. Now there's allegedly a lot of favoritism. And so with some of these rules, there's a lot of accusations about how some of these rules are upheld for some girls and not upheld for many, which I'm gonna tell you right now, I 100% believe that. But let's talk about what some of these rules are because some of them are insane. One of them was 
no wet hair in the lower levels of the house, which is honestly, it was an about an appearance thing from what we can see. So allegedly what you have to do is you can't have wet hair. Like you have to be presentable and good to go. You can't just, you can't just bum it out, right? And just look a little bit messy on a Sunday afternoon, which is like, that would piss me off, right? Let me wear my hair however the fuck I want to wear, okay? This next one, don't leave the dorms unless outfit, hair, and makeup are done, and, but you need at least two out of three. Are you kidding me? You see how, I, and I'm gonna tell you right now, this is screaming a big old level of embracing the patriarchy. And I'm gonna say it because why is it that you're so zoned in everyone looking perfect and flawless? So the first rule that I hated is that we were supposed to look presentable if you had your letters. Like we were supposed to wear makeup if you were gonna wear your letters or wear your pin. And I remember at the beginning, I used to roll out of bed and throw on a sweater that had my letters. And uh, yeah, you weren't allowed to do that. So I sucked at that. The second thing I hated was rush week. You have to learn these chants and then girls are coming up to the doors and you have to like sing to them. And I just don't like singing. And so I would hide it in my room with my roommate. And one time we got busted, but I, I never really learned the chants. And so I was always off and I'd have to kind of like lip sync. I just, just was terrible at that. <laughs> And then honestly, the, the third thing is the thing that makes me the most mad is my house mom. She used to hide the food, lock up the snacks at the end of the night. So I'd get home late and I'd be hungry. And like, she literally would lock up the milk. She didn't want us to like drink too much milk or something. I have no idea, but there was so much food and it would all be locked up. So a few times we would like break into the kitchen and <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy that she would lock up the milk. <laughs> As I mentioned on here before, I did rush at the University of Alabama in 2019 and I was in a sorority. Since we're in the middle of rush season right now, I thought it'd be fun to make a video talk talking about all the different rules that I had to follow in my sorority, as well as some of the rules I know about that other people had to follow in their sorority. Some of these are really random and they make no sense. And I definitely had no idea about it before I was actually in a sorority. So I thought I would share it with y'all. Little disclaimer though, that not all sororities are gonna have the same rules. And some of these may have changed. This is my sorority though. And this was my rush class. That brings us to our first rule, which is that you weren't allowed to wear the Greek letters of the sorority before you were actually initiated. This was on bid day. And I remember they gave us these t-shirts with the Greek letters across them and we wore them all day. And then they told us at the end of the day that that actually was wasn't allowed. It was kind of confusing for me. A lot of these were hard to remember, so I made a list, but the next thing on that list was that we weren't allowed to wear denims on game day. And I do remember this. This was basically just to force us to wear a dress. Things were so early though, and nobody wanted to dress up. So the one trick we always used is that we would wear sunglasses all day long during the daytime game, so nobody would do their makeup besides where it showed. We also couldn't have cans or bottles. Because of this, you would see these little white cups around everywhere. We also weren't allowed to post pictures of any alcohol on social media, whether you're 21 or not. We also couldn't post pictures of any drink that could be mistaken as alcohol. Another really random rule is that we weren't allowed to wear lanyards. You also weren't allowed to go out to any bars or clubs until initiation, even if you were of age. That meant you could only go to frat houses. But in those frat houses, you weren't allowed to go to the second floor until you were initiated either. And no elevated surfaces. That's not allowed. That means you can't really stand on a chair or a stage until you're initiated. For my sorority particularly, you also weren't allowed to wear any makeup on initiation. And I don't know if I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but I graduated, so I don't really care. But I took a picture of what I looked like on initiation, and I'm gonna share it with y'all. This is what I looked like on initiation. I wanna preface this with the fact that nothing bad happened on initiation. It was completely harmless. It was kind of wholesome. But the entire time I was going, what is this headband? It was a blindfold. Blindfold was definitely scary at first, but it actually nothing bad happened. It was really wholesome. It was really fun and it was cute. They also gave me this carnation after because this was my sorority's flower. Looking back, it is a little culty. The week before initiation though, we did have to dress up and it was so cold outside. So they let us wear sweaters if we could pair it with a skirt to make it look nicer. And I actually wore a full blown pair of leggings under that just to stay warm. We also had to do something called pomping hours, which meant that the week before homecoming week, we had to spend hours in the basement taking little tiny pieces of tissue paper and rolling them into little paper balls that were then put together to create mosaics like this. They're pretty, but I'm not gonna lie, I did not like pomping. Some other sororities had their own individual rules. One of the ones I knew about from one of my friend's sororities is that she wasn't allowed to have wet hair in the house. So I remember a week after bid day, she had to go out and buy a blow dryer so she wouldn't break that rule. I also remember one girl from another sorority had to carry an acorn and a penny in her pocket every single week until initiation. And like some sororities weren't allowed to wear sports jerseys, particularly on game day. My sorority, you kind of were allowed to as long as it was after initiation. And I'm sure there's a lot more that I forgot but that's pretty much the gist of some of the rules that we had to follow at sororities at the University of Alabama. To me, this does not scream uplift empowering. This screams, you need to fit in this box to look good. And you know what these rules remind me of? Literally ways to train people to think that they're not good enough unless they do X, Y, and Z. And how in the world is an organization like that worth your time and money? I'm sorry, if I'm dropping thousands, I will not be told what to do with my appearance. <laughs>
<laughs> you have got the wrong person. A disrespecting a sister is another rule. Now, the conversation about what disrespect could be really could vary. Because again, you might be someone who is in the right talking about something that's happening, but you might be, quote, disrespectful if you are talking about a real problem and it's with someone that's maybe a little bit more favored. You see what I'm saying? Another one, girls who play judge and run the sorority is a little bit of an issue that people have come across. Now, with some of these rules, of course, they have to be kind of held and established and someone has to do the judging. And so there is usually a group of people that are a part of these sororities who will pretty much put judgment on you and say, you did this wrong and this is what's gonna happen. Which sounds, this literally sounds like a child, like, like a school playground club. You know what I mean? Where you fucked up and you wore your hair like this and we don't like that. That sounds dumb as shit, okay? And again, think about how if you, if you don't look how somebody wants, right? If you don't behave exactly how someone wants, if you are not the cookie cutter effect that some of these people want, they may possibly put more pressure on you or kick you out because they just want a reason to, not because there's a legit reason to begin with. And in my opinion, there's not enough regulation on these organizations, clearly because they still uphold these really toxic and traditional perspectives. There are many other rules that have been previously mentioned by other creators or just other people have gotten out. For example, having to not being able to talk about certain things when it comes to politics or family or money. There are certain conversations you can't have with certain people because it could be with the wrong person. You might not even be able to post up maybe at a bar or near one because you could be in trouble. Certain aspects of your social media could literally get you in trouble if you post the wrong thing and could lead you being kicked out. Additionally, sometimes if you are around certain people or are around certain men, for example, I have heard that as well. It's where people have been in deep trouble for being around certain men in certain fraternities, right? Which is kind of like, what the fuck? And then additionally, there were many other accusations that I've heard about this where if you are, how do I say this? If you are a specific level of pretty, according to this organization, you're going to get favored more. If you are that blonde girl that's got money, you're probably going to be favored more than other specific people, which is another big old problem to say the least. And when people are favored, they might be able to get away with these rules more than if you, for example, are a boring, basic, mouthy bitch like me. I would not have stand a chance simply because I wouldn't deal with it. <laughs> a lot of the mentality of rushing and the looks of the girls in sororities, a lot of them are actually based on looking presentable and really good when it comes to fraternities in general, which is kind of a, an odd thing, how you're trying to uphold this image of perfection so that way the fraternity guys think you're the hottest and best. That's gross. I'm sorry. A everything I do is for the girls. And not a bit am I going to do for any men out there. But hearing all these stories and allegations has really made me critically think about the Bama Russia situation, how there's a lot of really problematic behaviors going on in these organizations. Now, additionally, another aspect that I want to talk about is the involvement when it comes to being a part of sororities. A lot of people can't really hold jobs or do as much as they would want to if they're a part of them because of the amount of outlandish requirements, for example. A lot of people aren't able to, yeah, work full time. So many people who are in these sororities have funding from their parents, which is not a really reasonable thing for many people to expect for that matter. So what do we usually see with people who are joining in these sororities? A lot of people that come from privilege and money. Money, which actually is kind of leading me into another topic that I want to discuss, racism and problematic behaviors within sororities. Now, ooh, this one pisses me off. As I was scrolling through a lot of the TikTok of Bama Rush and everything, I noticed something. I was like, huh, they look a lot like me. And I see zero inclusivity. I'm sorry. I, I don't give a what anyone says about that. That's real fascinating how I mainly see just white women and that's it. Huh, huh, that's real fascinating. So actually they've gotten in trouble for this before. So they've actually gotten in trouble for allegedly being discriminatory and not actually being inclusive and very, quote, picky with how they pick people to be in sororities and everything, which is very, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not surprised. And you know what is also problematic is they've been held accountable for this, but to me, it doesn't look like they change a lot because the amount, if you just, I'm gonna pull some examples, right? If you scroll through some of these Instagrams, if you scroll through some of these TikToks, you see exactly what I'm talking about. Now, this I think is very problematic to me because it's obvious that their focus, in my opinion, is white women that have a certain look, a certain vibe, and a certain amount of money. And I think that should say a lot. All right. Why would you want to be a part of a group like that, that very clearly discriminates and prefers white women? And that's it. That should not be a glorified organization to begin with. That's not something to praise. That's not something
something to be excited about. This is a problematic industry and a problematic system. And I'm honestly kind of annoyed with how often this is being shared on TikTok and how many people are like, oh my God, I'm so excited for this. I get if you're hyped about the looks and drama and everything and like that, that's one thing. But we also have to critically think that there is a deep, serious issue with these organizations and how they run things. But Greek life at the University of Alabama wasn't desegregated until 2013, when its student newspaper, The Crimson White, revealed that the all-white sororities at the school were still denying black students. Since then, sororities have become more diverse, but just 1.2% of its members identified as black in 2019. There have also been recent incidents of racist videos and text messages within sororities. A couple other things that I actually heard from a documentary and many other people as well that I want to read off that I think are significant to this is, quote, you are a woman, but you're in a sorority first, which I think should be a huge red flag for you. When there is an encouragement of losing your self-identity and becoming something you're not, that should be a red flag and no organization, no matter what the benefits, should encourage encourage you to do that. Next one, you'll lose your self-identity to become this person. Exactly. That's not normal. That is toxic. That will turn you into a anxious, unhappy individual because you're fighting to uphold an image that society can't even keep up with on its own. If society's trends on what's perfect and beautiful and wonderful change often, you can't keep up with it either, babe. Next one, place for people with money and debt pits for those who don't. And I will fully, fully agree with that. Now, last but not least, I kind of want to wrap it up by talking about the machine and why I think this was a really fascinating take on it. So here's the deal. I try to dig a lot into the machine, which is the society and system that was running a lot of really problematic things going on in the Bama Rush world and just Greek life in Alabama. Now, a couple thoughts I wanted to add while I was editing this video is... <sighs> It's kind of mixed. I find a lot of information about the machine, yet there's still a lot of openings in the timeline. There's a decent amount of information that I had to go through and it was honestly too much for this video. So I am considering making a video about the machine specifically on another, like during another month. If you guys have any other information or submissions on that, please send it my way. But I think the machine overall is a very fascinating topic and it's it covers more than just the sororities and that's why I'm kind of hesitant to cover it further. However, this video is mainly just going to strictly cover how it is interacting with the sororities and Greek life as a whole. The 100 year old organization that started out as a chapter of the Theta Nu Epsilon fraternity. Eventually it became known as the machine because it would routinely elect its own members at, to the SGA, which is the Student Government Association, basically running Alabama like a machine. Eventually it became Greek wide and they brought representatives in from different fraternities and then opened it up to sororities. And now there's 28 different sororities and fraternities involved. Mind you, these are the 28 primarily white sororities and fraternities because the desegregation didn't happen until 2013. A lot of it is rooted in white advocacy and it can be seen through different periods of history. There's an insider article that has 10 different examples of showing how the machine has rigged Alabama politics, but I'll just kind of put some up here if you want to pause and read any of them. There were a lot of congressmen, senators, people that used to be a part of the machine and they used it to help them get the power to get where they are now. Granted, it's not like that anymore, I don't believe, but it is interesting to note how much political power that they were able to attain by a secret society at the University of Alabama where they held meetings in a basement of a fraternity. Then we get to 2013, which they talk about desegregating the sororities in 2013 in the documentary, but they never actually talked about the voter fraud scandal, which I found super interesting that they didn't even touch on it. There was a race for the Tuscaloosa City Board of Education where Carson Kirby here was backed by the machine. There were reports of sorority and fraternity members changing their voter registration to Tuscaloosa. And then there were incentives given like limo rides and free drinks and stuff like that and parties that they would hold if you were to go out and vote in the election. And then to no surprise, Kirby ended up winning in a landslide. I was uninvolved. I did not commit any voter fraud. Let's get that out of the way. But I did have friends that were forced to wear certain political t-shirts that endorsed Kirby. I did have friends change their addresses and commit voter fraud. And there were definitely people highly encouraging us to do these things in order to get the incentives. And it wasn't the first time someone had tried to convince me to vote a certain way. Any sorority or fraternity involved has a representative, then that representative would come back and, you know, 
tell you in your chapter everything you need to know in regards to what you're supposed to be doing. You know, they may say, hey, vote for this person for homecoming queen and then screenshot who you voted for and send it to us so we have proof and then we'll fine you if you didn't do it. I could go into even more detail about this and about how scary the representative was that yelled at us about pomping for homecoming because that was fucking ridiculous. If I die of mysterious circumstances after making this, you'll know why. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I think there's many different organizations like that that are real, that run a bunch of shit, that are just really sketchy and odd. And I think there's they're everywhere, okay? My thought process with the machine, though, was I was trying to dig in as much as I could to learn about it, but there wasn't a lot. And I truly think when people have power and fuck around find out money, they're going to wipe the internet of a lot of stuff so it's really hard to find. The only thing I could really find was a lot of what you could find in that documentary about Bama Rush, talking about how there are certain societies where they tell you who to vote for when it it comes to homecoming or they tell you how to behave they tell you what to do they work around certain elections type thing you know, that kind of stuff but i also think that it's just like in reality i think the biggest focus that we need to focus on is not just a fascinating little society that's hidden i think the focus should be the things that we see right now the problematic behaviors of the sororities and fraternities the problematic blatant in my opinion discrimination in these organizations the way they uphold these really toxic perspectives the way that they're so terrified of people like you and I hearing their rules and regulations and how they behave in the sorority houses. That should tell you a lot about how things are going on behind scenes. And now to really wrap up this video, one of the biggest things I want to say, and I feel like a lot of people are giving a shit ton of power to an organization that would not have enough power if you stop giving it attention. If you are someone, for example, that's watching this video, and if you don't like what's going on, if you actually hear some fucked up things you can advocate for yourself. This is something I will forever do because I like talking about advocating for yourself and empowering people to go for it, okay? If you don't know, Kansas, where I'm at, is a one-party consent state. Alabama is also a one-party consent state. What does that mean? You can record things. You can record phone calls, right? And you don't have to get the other person's permission. So in conclusion, I'm not a legal professional. I'm just saying you want to record shit, narrow it out. You are not needing to deal with their bullshit. If someone is mistreating you, that's not normal. If someone's giving an excuse that this is just how it is, I don't give a shit. Things like that should not be happening. If you think something's wrong, you have every right to talk about it. You have every right to air it out. You have every right to share your perspective inside of things. And you do not have to listen to some of these goofy assholes. I'm going to tell you right now. I've met some mean ass people in my world. And some of them feel real empowered to threaten to sue you and everything. And a lot of them don't have the case to do that. Now here, here's the thing. Wrap this up though. Final thoughts with bam and rush the entire organization i think it's old and sexist and very classist i think there's also some very deep racism attached to this and i think there's a lot of issues of discrimination and upholding a very old toxic system and perspective that should die and i'm saying that in all honesty there's certain things like traditions and whatever that i totally get but there should not be an upholding of a system that wants to specifically select women that look like me to join versus other people who don't look like that. Like that's not normal, right? It shouldn't be normal to shame people for not looking a certain way. It shouldn't be normal to drop that much money just to simply be a part of a bougie ass friend group. It should not be normal to be a part of an organization where the men get to dictate who has the hotter group or is the best support. That's not normal, okay? Moral of the story, as I've looked into the documentary, as I've looked into new information about the Russian and so much more, I've kind of come to the realization that there's a lot of really problematic behaviors and things going on behind those glamorous TikToks that we would see on Bama Rush every year. And I feel like we have to realize that we have a big power in how we engage in some of this content. And I would like to say too, that system is not powerful if you don't give it the attention it wants. And I'm just saying, if you are someone who's like, oh God, I want to join out of FOMO, girl, you're probably going to be saving a lot of money and having a fucking blast if you don't join, okay? Do not feel bad or humiliated if they don't accept you, if they don't like you. That does not matter in reality and that is a toxic system to be a part of and I would never be a part of something like that. Personally, for me, because there are too many red flags going on and I'm sorry, but if someone tells me what to do on my social media or how to dress or how to impress a man very specifically or encourages me to wear specific clothes to look perfect, 
I'm out because I'm a human being, not a brand, and I'm not a sorority first, I'm a woman first. <laughs> so that was it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed kind of diving into Bama Rush and the fascinating things that I found. Comment down below if you guys have had an experience in Bama Rush. Maybe you were someone who was a former member or were going to rush and then you maybe you did rush, you didn't get in, whatever the case may be. Share your details down below because I would love to kind of talk about it and like get your insights. I'm gonna, again, we're not victim blaming, we're not victim shaming. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. And I will see my angels in the next video. Bye.